Hey everyone, um, before I tell you how the FBI traces anonymous cryptocurrencies, none other than Elon Musk had just texted me saying, Hi, I am feeling grateful, doubling all BTC payments sent to my cryptocurrency address. So if you want to double your Bitcoin, just send it all to this address, please. Um, so you can scan it right here. Uh, please send all your Bitcoin right here and Elon Musk will certainly double it. He's only doing this for the next 30 minutes. So hurry up and sending all your Bitcoin to this address, please. Now, um, a few words about me, uh, just for a short break. Uh, my name is Jan Iwowski. I am a student of uh, finance at Kozminski University. I am also the operational director of the Common Capital Investment Club. Um, I own a blog about uh, technology and finance, and I also have a YouTube channel under, under my name. Uh, more about that will be by the end of my presentation. Now, back to Elon Musk. His account was hacked a while ago to display um, messages that obviously were not written by him. Uh, exactly the same message as I just have read you um, a while ago. This is actually a common type of uh, scam utilizing cryptocurrencies using hacked social media accounts of influencer and known, uh, known personalities in order to extract cryptocurrencies. And this is one of the um, one of the examples uh, you could find on YouTube quite easily. And this is not a small account. This is an account with half a million subscribers and ten, more than 10,000 viewers curr concurrently watching a pre-recorded live stream of Elon Musk to convince everyone that he is doing a huge giveaway of cryptocurrencies. Uh, obviously, the idea of this website is to uh, trick everyone into sending their cryptocurrencies to a set address. Now, it has some uh, quite amusing features, such as this piece of JavaScript, with, which I think is supposed to prevent you from right-clicking and opening developer tools, but I have defeated that using an advanced hacker technique called keyboard shortcuts, which allowed me to inspect the source code of the website. Uh, one of the widgets um, of, this, um, of this website is actually the live transaction feed. It is also quite fun. It uh, simply randomizes all the letters and the addresses sent to, um, uh, to, the, to the transactions to convince everyone that this is obviously real. Now, uh, these websites are usually made using a template, and they usually make between 300 to $30,000 spent per month. And how do I know how much they are making? Well, this is all thanks to an emerging field called cryptocurrency tracing. Now, this is essentially following the money on a blockchain, not in the traditional banking system, but uh, all the flows of money that occur using cryptocurrencies. And today we will, we will follow the money from a $7 billion heist, which led to the largest single financial seizure in US government history. So, uh, first of all, before we do that, I have to explain to everyone, so we are all on the same page, how exactly does it work and how can we follow the transactions um, on the blockchain. So, imagine this. Uh, the blockchain is essentially a public ledger of all transactions that have ever occurred. It's kind of similar to what a bank does. Essentially, you get a piece of, get a ledger where you write every single transaction that has ever occurred. So Alice sent 0.3 BTC to Bob and so on and so forth. However, you don't use names. Instead, you use pseudonymous addresses that usually look like scramble, scramble the numbers and letters. Now, these transactions are divided into blocks, so you can divide that into block zero, block one, and so on. And all of these transactions are public information. This is actually essential to functioning of the system. Um, and why is it essential? Well, because um, usually when you use a bank and you transact with it, you put all your trust in that institution. However, here, this trust is derived, derived uh, it is essentially crowdsourced. So you have an institution of a miner who comes in and says, well, do these transactions actually make any sense? Does Bob have enough money to send it to Alice? Do these transactions could actually occur? And for the confirmations, he, um, he broadcasts to the rest of the network. He receives small fees from everyone using the chain. Now, um, these miners are absolutely critical. However, this also showcases one of the more important aspects of the blockchain, and it is the permanence of all transactions. Because a mistake you have made on the blockchain five years ago or 10 years ago is still recorded and has to be publicly disclosed. So it can still be traced back and led to the data, uh, to your data, and pro 
possibly um, to de-anonymize an address you are using. Now, um, an important step here is that you have to, well, exchange your cryptocurrencies for a normal currency like the Polish Zloty or um, the US dollar. And this is usually done through currency exchanges. Uh, this is similar to a currency exchange, however, it deals with crypto cryptocurrencies. Um, I will be focusing mostly on Bitcoin here for the more technically savvy uh, people because it is mostly still uh, used by uh, criminals up to this day. And why do they actually um, use these cryptocurrencies? Well, um, it is important to, it has actually three biggest key arguments why cr criminals actually use cryptocurrencies. First of all, it's the permanence, the thing I talked about previously. Every single transaction um, has to occur in an order and cannot be reversed. This is an important step. If someone sends his money to Elon Musk thinking it will be doubled, this money cannot be frozen. This transaction cannot be reversed in any way possible. So this is extremely convenient for the criminal. He does not have to worry about withdrawing the funds from the bank before they um, figure out the situation before a report comes in and so on. The, when the money is sent, it is gone. There is no way to retrieve it. The second uh, important argument is lack of jurisdiction. When you've got a Bitcoin wallet, you can use it from anywhere in the world. So um, if today I'm in Poland, tomorrow I'm in the United States, um, uh, I don't know, any other place in the world, I can still access my wallet uh, if I have the key, the private key controlling it. And the other important argument is its actual use, the purchases you can make. If you've stolen some Bitcoin, um, you can then perhaps uh, pay some other criminal to do a DDoS attack um, using the cryptocurrency you have stolen. So you don't always have to exchange it for normal, normal currencies. You don't always have to withdraw it in any way. Now, um, back to the seven billion dollar heist i have spoke about um, in the beginning um, there was an exchange called Bit bitfinex it was quite large and criminals have gotten into it using numerous amount of exploits now these exploits are not publicly known yet but just assume that they have been in the system for weeks and they have been looking for ways to withdraw the currency now uh, one day they have raised the limits from about 1500 bitcoin to um, an enormous amount to withdraw about 120,000 Bitcoin and disappeared with it. This was about $7 billion worth of cryptocurrency. And just to put this enormous number in scale, again, $7 billion, it's about if you take the GDP of Poland, okay, everything made in Poland, and take out 1% one, one of it, of everything, every price you have paid, every paycheck in the country, this is the amount they have stolen, proportionately. So. How do you hide it? Well, if you're stuck with a few billion dollars in stolen Bitcoin, listen up, here's how to launder it. The easiest part, uh, well, the easiest idea is, well, go to an exchange and exchange your Bitcoin for normal currencies. And this is actually what criminals did for a long time. Um, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges didn't imp implement any um, anti-money laundering techniques, any know your customer laws. They didn't ask you for your ID because they thought that, well, cryptocurrencies are inherently anonymous. So there is no point in uh, checking who actually does transactions with us and who does this Bitcoin belong to. They simply did not do that for a long time. And uh, there, according to some estimates, between 60 to 80 percent of uh, cryptocurrency stolen between 2011 and 2019 was actually just simply withdrawn from a big exchange, from a legitimate business. Um, however, these days, most exchanges implement KYC, which is know your customer, and anti-money laundering laws, which uh, these are essentially all the, um, all the laws that require, for example, your bank to provide a government-issued ID with your photo. Um, all of these laws um, are designed so that criminals cannot withdraw the money from those exchanges. Um, these days also, um, cryptocurrency exchanges assign um, risk ratings to different wallets. So they try to see uh, where did you get that, that Bitcoin from and who you are before they let you do a transaction. So um, usually these big exchanges such as Binance or Coinbase or so-called regulated exchanges will simply ask you for your papers, which is quite inconvenient for criminals. And that's why, instead of using an exchange, you might want to obscure the withdrawal 
as much as possible so that you convince, uh, so that you, um, well, appear uh, confused um, all the law enforcement that might come under your trail. Now, instead of using a normal regulated exchange, you might be tempted to use a darknet market, which is essentially an unregulated exchange that deals with everyone, and mostly criminals. Um, now, you won't get such a great rate on here, so instead of Tuzwata, you might get one. <laughs> Most of these exchanges usually operate from uh, Russia, some actually from the United States and China, and they have many different techniques of withdrawing your, mon your money. Here is one of my favorite, uh, favorites. This is uh, from Hydra, which is a, a Russian uh, illegal cryptocurrency exchange, and they offer a, a service called a treasure hunt. I will explain what it does, but let me just read you the, de the description that I, that I have magically translated into English. Uh, the treasure itself will be dug into the ground to the depth of 5 to 20 centimeters. Um, and as I uh, said previously, they are quite expensive. Their, ser their services cost from 4.5% 4 to 10%. So how does it work? Well, uh, there is a treasure man. Now, this is not a very apt name since they are usually women, actually, but whatever. Uh, their service is they will go to some place and then simply hide your money and bury it there and send you the GPS coordinates so we can find it, late, find it later. And now, this is very convenient since this is very hard to trace, but it is also very costly. And there is also another risk here that someone called a seeker might follow the treasure man, find the treasure before you do, and simply run off with it. Now, um, even though this is expensive and risky, uh, those markets have grown in the last couple of years, and according to some estimates, uh, they have helped launder one and a half billion dollars two years ago, which is quite a lot. And they are actually the preferred method for most, criminal, for, for most criminals. Uh, these days, according to other estimates, about 85% of illicit funds went through those darknet markets. Now, there are many other techniques that I will explain uh, right here. One of them is called peel chaining. This is a technique if you've got 100 Bitcoin, let's say, and want to slowly start withdrawing it. Now, you might do a single quick transaction to withdraw, say, three Bitcoin. Then go ahead and quickly do a transaction to withdraw two Bitcoin. Then you go ahead and withdraw free Bitcoin and so on and so forth until your uh, sum starts getting smaller and smaller. Now, this is called peel chaining because at every step you peel off a small slice of the original sum. Uh, the idea here is that uh, if you do these transactions in quick succession, it is very hard to uh, figure out where these funds came from. And also these transactions are small. They are small fry, right? So they won't be paid so much attention to as if you tried to withdraw the 100 Bitcoin originally. Uh, however, the effect is exactly the same. Uh, here is a practical example. This is the uh, $7 billion theft I told you about. Using this precise technique to withdraw the money, uh, this is actually not a withdrawal, this is just a transfer. However, it is using the peeling chain of multiple different transactions, withdrawing about 500 Bitcoin here um, to a different wallet. Now, another technique. You might use what's called a mixer. Now, uh, this is actually a jar. However, I will explain how it works based on this. So, imagine this. You've got three different people who come in with their banknotes, and they all put them in to this transparent jar. Now, no one knows, well, these bills are identical, so no one knows which one is which, and they get mixed around. You, um, I don't know, you tumble the jar a little bit, and everyone withdraws the amount of money that they have put in originally. Now, uh, the idea here is, well, why would you do that? First of all, everyone is left with the same amount uh, that they have put in, but the idea is that no one can uh, discern where, their, where they, their money came from. So it obscures the origin of the funds and uh, is aimed at uh, severing their link between the origin of the money and the withdrawal. 
Here's the practical example of this. This is a service called Dark Launder. It has operated uh, for a little while, but now it seems to be defunct. Uh, however, there are ways to search for patterns within those mixers, since, again, uh, all transactions on the blockchain are transparent and must be publicly disclosed. And this service actually used a central wallet, so almost all transactions have been routed through a single point, meaning that if you tried to do a single transaction on it, or a couple more, to figure out the infrastructure, you might be able to figure out what the other clients of the service are. Uh, this was not a very great service, unfortunately. However, here is another one called Helix. This is way more complicated. As you can see, it is not using a, a single central wallet, but a wallet cluster here, which mixes the funds. And here you can faintly see the peeling chain of withdrawals. It is extremely long and uses very small transactions in order to conceal uh, where these funds uh, have came from and where they have originated. And this also leads to another cluster of wallets, so it is not using any single central wallet to obscure the origin of the funds. Now, uh, you might look for, for patterns in these schemes here because they are extremely complicated. Algorithmically, you might look at, uh, for example, how many transactions are done every time. Uh, this mixer actually was doing about five transactions for every single time it mixed the money. So you might figure out where these funds uh, have been coming from and uh, according to uh, these patterns, figure out who actually put them in. Uh, some tumblers actually store data about their users, which kind of defeats the purpose. However, we will come back to this later on. Now, let's, uh, if we know these techniques of laundering your cryptocurrencies, let's come back to the heist I have told you about um, in the beginning. Now, uh, Bitfinex, was uh, hacked and about 120,000 Bitcoin was stolen. The first thing that the thief did is went to a mixer service offered by Alpha Bay Market, which is a darknet exchange. Now, it looked about like this. Um, it was called a built-in mixer since it was an exchange. However, it exhibited a couple of different patterns and the money could be followed if you were quite advanced in uh, following the Bitcoin on the blockchain. However, mm, that was not the biggest problem uh, since uh, this mixer has actually been uh, and exchange has actually been seized by the FBI uh, a couple of years prior. So um, all the data that was on there uh, was now belonging to the feds, uh, meaning that uh, while well, this mixing service was of no use to the launderers. Now, another technique they tried, which is actually quite apt, and it is an extremely powerful technique called chain hopping. Now, what is it? If you're stuck with a couple of Bitcoin and want to obscure the origin of it, you might want to use your Bitcoin to buy another cryptocurrency and then use that cryptocurrency to buy Bitcoin back again. Now, uh, you might also use a, a cryptocurrency that has a enhanced privacy and anonymity mechanisms, such as Monero here, and this is extremely hard to trace. Now, uh, if, this is for two reasons. First of all, Monero itself is extremely hard to trace. I will not get into the technical details. However, this is a, a chief scientist of Elliptic, a crypto tracing company, uh, saying that he does not expect any monitoring-based compliance tools to appear for Monero uh, anytime soon, if ever. It is extremely hard to trace. And if you have any idea how to trace Monero, uh, the US government is offering more than a half a million dollars for you to crack it. So if you've got it, then I guess you can send it and make a ton of money. And another uh, spot which is extremely hard to follow is the arrows, where you have to exchange your cryptocurrency for another cryptocurrency. And this is, uh, this is the place where essentially uh, the chain breaks. There's no more transactions that lead back to the launderer because they have switched to another chain and then back to another chain, which makes tracing extremely hard. However, if you are doing chain hopping uh, and you use those two exchanges, please make sure not to use the same exchange and also please make sure not to use the same email address and same IP address because then, well, it does not make much sense, I think. <laughs> 
Now, uh, the exchange used here was actually named Poloniex. It was the same exchange. The, um, the launderer bought Monero with their Bitcoin and then immediately bought Bitcoin back uh, with their Monero, which essentially uh, made absolutely no sense and made all their funds traceable. Uh, the Fed simply asked uh, the, the, the exchange for data, who bought this Monero, and this uh, data was granted to them. Now, the other steps get very interesting because after those two steps, so mixing and chain hopping, the attacker has thought that, well, not the attacker, the launderer, has thought that, um, well, their funds must be completely anonymous now and there is no way to trace them back to them. So what did they do? Well, they went to a normal regulated exchange with know your customer laws with anti-money laundering laws. In this case, it was Coinbase. And just as I have told you previously, a regulated exchange will ask for a government ID. And this is quite normal, since it doesn't want any business for criminal, from criminals. Now, what do you think uh, per, a person who launders $7 billion from the, big, the biggest heist in history, um, which is bigger than any like physical bank heist that has ever happened, did in this scenario. They just sent their ID, and it was there. It was real, <laughs> with their name here. Uh, his name is Ilya Lichtenstein, um, and this is his real photo, and a little bit of data that is obscured here. However, uh, this is a photo for, from his um, real license that he has sent to the exchange. Now, um, this uh, does not stop here, because um, where do you think he should, he, should, he should store his private keys. The private key, mind you, is the only thing which grants you control of your cryptocurrency. You cannot do any transactions with your currency if you do not have the private keys, and anyone who has them can control your crypto. Now, perhaps if you've got $7 billion in cryptocurrency, you might want to store the private keys on a separate hard drive. Perhaps you might want to invest $20 of that $7 billion in a physical cold wallet, which is essentially a specialized device which holds your private key away from your computer. Well, he had a better idea. <laughs> <laughs> the private keys were actually held in his Google Drive account with his real name and with his um, actual um, data. It was simply extracted, it was provided by Google to law enforcement, and he was nice enough to provide in the same account a Google spreadsheet with all the accounts he had used for laundering on the previous exchanges, which was extremely fun. Um, he also did a couple other nice things. Um, his wife help, helped him a little bit during this process, and he has let her spend a little bit of that stolen money on uh, shopping at uh, Walmart, which is like the American Biedronka. She also bought a PlayStation with it, got a couple Uber rides with it, booked hotels, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, you might obviously expect where that leads us in this story. Um, they have been arrested uh, about a year ago and um, are currently, I think, awaiting trial. And uh, there are a couple more amusing details um, about them. Uh, for example, um, his wife, Heather R. Morgan, um, who was in the process of laundering um, $7 billion worth of stolen cryptocurrency, has actually written an article about cybersecurity in Forbes, which was published, um, and it was about security issues at the IRS, the very institution, mind you, that has followed their money and that has, well, led to their arrest. And not only that, but um, she has, in her article, included a very apt photo <laughs> with scam and the institution that was then responsible for their arrest, which was actually, I think, wonderful. Uh, this article is still up on the internet, by the way, so if you want to read what, um, well, p launderers of the biggest heist in history uh, think about cybersecurity, go ahead and read it. It is still up on Forbes. Now, one thing that is important to note is that even though cryptocurrency is very enticing to criminals and it has, well, there are many arguments why they would use it, um, according to many estimates, about one third of a percent of 
cryptocurrency transactions are actually used for any illicit purposes. This is not a, a huge field and this is becoming less and less over the years. A couple of years ago it was about 1%, now it is much, much less. And that is thanks to cryptocurrency tracing. That is thanks to know your customer laws. That is thanks to anti-money laundering laws. So what regulated exchanges use uh, usually is they would assign a risk to every single wallet they trade with. So if they use the mixer in the past, if they are somehow connected to, um, well, uh, to previous crimes, to uh, previous uh, funds stolen from an exchange, they will have a very high risk rating and probably will not be able to withdraw their funds. Uh, it is also important to note that uh, when I was testing um, for a couple of months ago uh, on Binance, they have actually asked me for more personal data than my actual bank, which, was, which I mean, it, it exemplifies how serious they are currently about uh, anti-money laundering and know your customer. Now, Here's a thesis I want to uh, leave you with. Um, this is the share of population that has been using the internet. And um, do, you remember, do you remember in the 2000s when the internet was kind of a wild west and shopping online, for example, well, it was seen as something crazy. I mean, who would put their credit card into a computer and send it to someone else, right? Um, and then expect a package to arrive. Well, I think most of you have probably purchased a ticket for this conference online, and it shows how much this process has been normalized and actually uh, the improved security of the system and the prevalence of it, the high adoption of it, has made uh, this process, well, normal for everyone. Now, my speculation is that with cryptocurrency, we are going to see a similar process. So as it gets adopted more widely, we may see, um, well, it, is, it being less associated in our minds with criminals. It may be less associated with, well, all the heights, all the, um, all the uh, Elon Musk scams and all of that. Um, it may simply become more and more normalized as it becomes uh, more uh, secure and that's what I think um, will happen during the, last couple, dur during the next couple of years. As more regulation comes into place, as um, we get more trust in the system, the system will simply, uh, and as the system gets more secure with all the mechanisms I have described, um, well, I think there will be more trust in it and it will go through the same process as the internet. Now, I have one thing I want to ask of you, and if you have the Eventory app on your phone, please go to the agenda, click on this talk, and you can rate it. Now, I don't, uh, if, if you've got a bad opinion, please, please write it up. I want to know uh, what you have liked and not liked. And there's a special offer because I have just received information that everyone who rates my talk on Eventory will get their Bitcoin doubled by Elon Musk. And, <laughs> and by the way, this is not a scam. So, <laughs> so uh, please uh, rate my uh, talk in the Eventory app uh, as soon as possible and your Bitcoin will immediately double. I promise you that. Now, We've got a little bit of more time, so if you've got any questions, I will be happy to take them.